Good evening. Oh, I don't need to talk that loud, do I? <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Molly Mitchell-Moore. I am the head of the history department here at Washington and Lee. Um, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Uh, and thanks to the WNL Phi Beta Kappa ch chapter, uh, as well as to the history department for making this evening possible. Uh, I'd also like to um, extend my gratitude to Emily Cook um, in Phi Beta Kappa and the library who did much of the heavy lifting uh, to make this possible, uh, as well as to Kara Hemphill, who's the administrative assistant in the history department, um, who did most of the logistical work for this evening. Uh, I'm thrilled tonight to welcome our guest historian Julian Zelizer. Julian has been among the pioneers in the revival of American political history. He is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst and regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He is the author and editor of 20 books, including The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for Great Society the winner of the D.B. Hardiman Prize for Best Book on Congress. His most recent book, co-authored with Kevin Cruz, is Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. In April 2020, Penguin will publish his new book, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party. Apparently, Julian does not sleep very much. Uh, he's currently writing a new book about Abraham Joshua Herschel for the Jewish Lives series of the Yale University Press. Zelizer, who has published over 1,000 op-eds, has received fellowships from the Brookings Institution, the Guggenheim Federation, uh, Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the New York Historical Society, and New America. He also co-hosts a popular podcast called Politics and Polls. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Julian Zelizer. Thank you, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's been wonderful to spend some time with the uh, students. I've really enjoyed the conversations, uh, and, and you have a very impressive school here. Uh, and also, thank you to everyone, um, Molly, Emily, everyone who set this whole event up. I know all the work that goes into these kinds of things, so um, I appreciate it. And years ago, uh, uh, we met, well, I was her mentor at a fellowship in, uh, in, at the University of Virginia. So it's wonderful to see her flourishing as a, a professor and a scholar here. I want to give this talk about President Trump in a pretty a tumultuous moment uh, for his presidency, one where the future uh, of the presidency is now in question and the dynamics of what's going on in Washington vis-a-vis -vis impeachment have changed dramatically, not just since the first time I gave this lecture uh, for Phi Beta Cap, but just about a month and a half ago, but even within the last few days. But I want to start by moving back and, and trying to look at President Trump in context. President Trump's rhetoric, his strategy, his style could not be more different than his predecessor, Senator Bar uh, President Barack Obama, who as senator back in 2004, said the following at the Democratic National Convention in Boston. It is that fundamental belief, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, that makes this country work. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams and yet still come together as one American family. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Now, even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits, the pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states, red states for Republicans, blue states for Democrats. But I've got news for them too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states 
and we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. We coach Little League in the blue states, and yes, we've got some gay friends in the red states. There are patriots who oppose the war in Iraq, and there are patriots who supported the war in Iraq. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes, all of us defending the United States of America. Well, many, and, and I always show that in my undergraduate class, and uh, look at it both as the promise of a candidate thinking about what he aspires to do, and then looking back at why exactly that didn't come to fruition. And as we look now at President Trump and, and try to understand what's going on during this presidency, I, I think it's a mistake to look at it just in the politics of the moment. We must see President Trump through the lens of contemporary political history, a product rather than the cause of deep changes that have taken place in the way that American politics works over the past four decades. While President Trump is clearly more extreme and unconventional than anyone we have seen in the Oval Office in recent decades, if not ever, there is a foundation to the way that he practices his politics and I want to touch on some themes in the book Fault Lines that certainly help me understand what's been going on. I want to talk about four in particular. The first is political polarization in American politics since the 70s. The second is the changing media landscape. The third is the persistence of illiberalism in the American political tradition. And finally is the survival of expansive presidential power after Watergate. Let's start with political polarization. President Trump counts on the fact that few Republicans will consider voting for Democrats. And so his goal from day one has been to drive up GOP turnout and to solidify his support within the Republican Party as much as possible. Despite the loss in the House in the 2018 midterms and the clear vulnerability of the president going into his reelection campaign, what this strategy has done is to allow him to retain most of his support within the GOP, even as he's pushed the envelope in terms of policy, in terms of governing, and in terms of rhetoric. Until now, Trump was able to survive a multitude of scandals and crises by holding the support of the Congressional Republican Caucus in the House and Senate, as well as much as of the Republican electorate. Oops, sorry. And while he has not been able to break through the 50% approval rating, which is a significant fact, equally interesting is the fact that his numbers have hovered at about the same level, regardless of what he does, and even when he plays to the most controversial elements of his electorate. He has fed the Republican Party's partisan interest with favorable court nominations and with a series of policy moves on deregulation that have been highly favored within the party. And so far, he's avoided a serious party challenge in the primary from any major candidate. Trump has absorbed the fact that America is a deeply polarized nation, whereas other presidents such as Obama have tried to push back against partisan divisions, Trump relishes in them. In some ways, he sees our political world more clearly than the centrists and unifiers who wish it were different. The president's method has support from social scientists. The overwhelming weight of recent scholarship has pointed to two major trends in American politics since the 1960s. First, is that partisan polarization has greatly intensified as the number of people who could be identified as centrists has vastly diminished in roll call votes. Centrism has faded as a major force, whereas about 30% of senators and representatives could be classified as centrists in the 1970s based on their actual voting. That number fell to under 10% by the 1990s and has fallen much further today. Legislators such as uh, Richard Lugar, who in the 1980s was a staunch conservative and on the right side 
of the Republican Party by the time he departed from Congress could be counted as one of the centrist voices within the party. And it wasn't that someone like him changed, it was that the party changed around him. And that's the second change social scientists talk about, that as the parties have polarized, the Republican Party has moved further to the right and has become more unified than Democrats have moved to the left and have been able to unify themselves. As Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein wrote in their book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, quote, the use of legislative obstruction to weaken the federal government is a strategy that Republicans embarked on decades ago. Starting in the 1970s, when young renegades like Newt Gingrich, a rising star, introduced an aggressive style of politics that eviscerated opponents and brought bipartisan negotiations to a halt. After the 1970s, congressional Republicans used a series of mechanisms, an aggressive use of the filibuster, party leadership packs, and more to make sure that members of the party voted the party line. The GOP's reliance on legislative obstruction accelerated uh, when Gingrich and then Gingrich's successors after the 1990s practiced the art even more effectively. Upon resigning in 2006, former Majority Leader Tom DeLay, who had been uh, a, a key Republican during this period from Texas, famously said on the floor of the House when he was leaving office that he refused to call on Congress to enter a new era where both sides got along. Instead, he said, I can't do that because partisanship properly understood is not a symptom of democracy's weakness but of its health and its strength, especially from the perspective of a political conservative. During the 2016 election, the power of partisanship was the basis of Donald Trump's victory. There was very little movement in the electoral map. Although a small number of Democrats did vote uh, for the Republican ticket in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, the real key to Trump's electoral college victory was that in the final weeks of the campaign, Trump was able to whip up Republican energy behind the ticket, and the red states didn't turn blue, as some had predicted. And this was essential, or his approximately 78,000 vote margin in those swing states wouldn't really have mattered. Faced with the choice between Trump and Clinton on election day, Republicans came home. Trump's theory of politics has been crucial to his success on Capitol Hill. The president has depended on the Republican Congress to protect him from investigation and to send key legislative items, such as the corporate tax cut of 2017, to his desk for signature. There have been a handful of Republicans, such as former Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona, who've enjoyed criticizing the president on television and Twitter, but by and large, Republicans have voted in unison. Those numbers still have standing in the polls. According to a recent uh, Quinnipiac and Monmouth University polls, the share of Republican voters supporting the president rose by 12 points since the Ukraine story broke, uh, with the number of Republicans, according to the polls, calling him honest, going up from 66 to 83%. Again, that's since the Ukraine story broke. Trump has not left this to chance. He's been extremely aggressive, staying on the campaign trail, holding rallies to build his own support, and to make sure that candidates in key states understand what the cost is of opposing him. Many Republican candidates have declared their allegiance to the president as the head of the party. And while the president did do horribly, in, or his party did, in the House midterms of 2008, his majority went up in the Senate, which was notable and uh, consequential because it continued to offer him a path toward uh, confirming conservative federal judges, which is key to the Republican party, and again, until now, to protect him from the impeachment process. 
With Trump counting on the fact that Republican legislators will always come home, he's been able to employ a parliamentary style of governing in which the White House and the congressional party of the White House act with a degree of unity that even President Woodrow Wilson might have admired. The second pillar of Trump's presidency has been the way our news media works in this period. President Trump has shown a keen understanding of the way that the media works, whether it's uh, instinctive or whether it's an actual understanding, I don't know, but he's used it to dominate the national conversation and to throw opponents off guard in a way that we haven't seen in recent decades. The president has a fundamental grasp of the way that the media has changed since the 1970s with the emergence of 24-hour sensationalized, partisan, and ongoing media that is constantly in search of content and eye-catching news. His provocative statements injected into the media bloodstream through Twitter shape and dominate the news cycle in ways that, again, we have not seen. To understand what Trump is doing, it's important, especially for younger students, to go back in time. The changes started in the 1970s, when the big three networks that dominated the news, NBC, ABC, and CBS, as well as the handful of city papers that were most prominent in national coverage, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun, they started to lose their hold. On television, cable news networks were the first to start revolutionizing what the media landscape looked like. CNN, the original cable news network, introduced the 24-hour news cycle when it first went on the air on June 1st, 1980. And that's a picture from the first broadcast. And unlike the old networks, never went off the air. Other competitors would follow suit, replicating the model in a world where the news cycle became continuous and ongoing. Notably, unlike the older broadcast networks, the new cable news channels that start to take form in the 1980s consciously followed the model that was really pioneered by MTV, which launched in 1981, the music channel, called Narrowcasting. Rather than seeking to bring as many viewers into a network on points of middle and common ground, they instead start, sought to reach smaller and more specialized pockets of viewers where they already were, catering to their interest with specialized styles of programming. Unlike the old networks, which had earned most of their revenue from news programs like sitcoms and soap operas, the new generation of cable news networks depended solely on the success of the news shows. The strict wall that had separated the hard news divisions from the softer news divisions in all networks, both the regular networks and the cable networks, started to break down by the end of the 1980s. Everyone was concerned about the bottom line. As television expanded into this 24-hour format, always glomming on to the most exciting story of the moment, newspapers started to worry that they were going to become irrelevant. So one of the pioneers of the new era of print journalism was USA Today, which many of you now only probably get when you're staying in a hotel or maybe walking through the airport. But when it hit newsstands on September 15, 1982, it was seen as a very innovative development. The slick paper offered a stark contrast to the staid pages of the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal aiming to replicate the tenor of television with glossy photographs, short articles, and uh, sensational headlines. Here's the first issue of USA Today. The first issue had headlines like, your kid really may be sick of school, and covered sensational topics like the death of Princess Grace in Monaco, which editors selected instead of the assassination of the president-elect of Lebanon because they thought it would attract more readers. The dynamics on television and radio changed again when partisan news came to be seen as legitimate. 
In 1987, President Ronald Reagan and his Federal Communications Commission ended a decades-old policy known as the Fairness Doctrine. The FCC rule, established in 1949, had required stations to provide equal time to opposing political views in any discussion of something controversial. It was meant to provide some kind of balance. In practice, many radio stations often tested the limits of whether this would be enforced, but it created incentives and encouraged producers, hosts, and editors to play things down the middle. But Reagan believed the rule hampered conservative voices who didn't have access to many mainstream outlets, and he also opposed most forms of regulation. The end of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 ushered in a radically new era of news. As the nation was becoming increasingly polarized along partisan lines, producers and executives began to realize that there was money to be made in presenting the news from a particular political perspective. Almost overnight, when the Fairness Doctrine was gone, the media landscape was transformed with the driving force being talk radio. In 1960, there were only two all-talk radio stations in the country. By 1995, there were 1,130. While television news on the old networks and the cable upstart CNN still adhered to standards of objectivity, on all-talk radio and the stations and shows emerging in the late 80s and early 90s, anything went. New York conservative talk radio host Bob, I uh, Bob Grant was one of the most notorious of the lot. He had long been known for testing the limits of the Fairness Doctrine, but after it was gone, he started to go on air and espouse views that had not really been heard on a regular basis. During the 1991 Los Angeles riot, he complained, heaven forbid you talk about white rights in this country. And here's a little clip of Bob Grant speaking about immigration. Immigration. A worthy candidate for the presidency will push for the repeal of the 1965 Immigration Reform Act and instead substitute a very limited program whereby no more than 20,000 to 30,000 legal immigrants could come into this country every year. Other than that, we need a moratorium on immigration for at least five to ten years just so we can catch our breath. Foreign affairs. This is related to what I just said. A good president would declare war against the foreign powers currently trying to occupy and colonize us. In other words, he'd stop the flow of illegal aliens from third world countries. I wish people would wake up to the fact that the current flood of 300,000 illegal immigrants a year is identical to an act of war. Foreigners have violated our land like an enemy army, and for the same reason, too. They want what we have. They could never take us on militarily, so they're doing it by the only devious method they have available. We need stronger borders and tough sanctions against the countries these armies come from. Beyond that... In 1996, Fox News followed suit on television, offering the most powerful example of what a partisan news organization could look like. Uh, Robert, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes, who had been a prominent Republican operative since the late uh, 1960s, saw that this was a new market uh, in news broadcasting. Meanwhile, MSNBC, which also went on the air in 1996, originally as a pretty straight news organization, learned during the George W. Bush presidency that there was some room to do the same on the liberal side, although never quite as successful. Uh, in recent years, we've seen some proliferation of more liberal outlets, especially in the area of podcasting. The expansion of the internet in the early 2000s only intensified this news culture in an increasingly competitive market with endless number of sites and a constant news cycle in need of content. Online provider, providers leaned and, uh, and looked for attention-grabbing headlines and easily digested stories while social media offered ways to promote stories based on likes, 
retweets, and more as a form of legitimacy. President Trump has used his understanding and feel for this world to constantly keep his political opponents off guard and to make it extraordinarily difficult for Democrats or even non-allied Republicans to get any attention for the issues that matter to them. Through his Twitter feed, he constantly disrupts the news cycle and makes it hard for the most well-meaning of journalists to try building sustained interest in stories that are not in the interest of the administration. Even as there is negative press against him, he's able to use the coverage uh, as a way to promote policy messages that he cares about. He counts on the quickly changing news pattern to allow him to take multiple positions that are often contradictory or make no sense when added up together. The president has found a lot of support in the conservative media for what he has been doing. He often draws his language and expertise directly out of the world of conservative media, where he made a name for himself before becoming president as part of the birther movement and has been in an ongoing conversation with Fox Television since the time of his campaign. Bill Shine, a top producer at Fox, served as White House Deputy uh, Chief of Staff for Communications. One official privately told me, a very high-ranking official, that they learned early on in the presidency that the best way to get his attention was not by making an argument in an Oval Office meeting, but by going on television and making the point that the, they wanted the president to hear. And there's a close connection between what you hear from the president and the kind of language that you see on conservative shows as opposed to other networks. And here's a little example on issues such as immigration. So partisan polarization, the media. The third is that uh, uh, the, the, the one that might be hardest in some ways for many uh, people to digest is that a lot of the most socially divisive elements of President Trump's conservative populism is deeply inscribed in the American political tradition as much as Ronald Reagan's optimism or Barack Obama's call for racial and political hearing, healing. The problem with much of President Trump's rhetoric is not just what it says about the administration, but what it says about us. Nativism, for example, is nothing new in this country. Each era when the nation has liberalized its immigration policies, as this cartoon shows, to let more people into the country, the open doors have always been followed by a fierce backlash. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was followed by several years of brutal violence against Chinese workers. The influx of immigrants in the early 20th century from Eastern and Southern Europe ended with intense attacks that found respectability at the highest levels of power. Scholarly experts were praised when they promoted the pseudoscience of eugenics to demonstrate how the brains of urban newcomers were inferior. Politicians warned of race suicide for Anglo-Saxons, and even progressive reformers were desperate to Americanize the foreigners who were living in cities such as New York and Chicago. In 1921 and 1924, Congress passes legislation that puts into place a national quota system, which granted specific nationalities, particularly Eastern Europeans, much more limited access to entering into the country. And of course, race has always been part of the American bloodstream. This recent special issue of the New York Times, for example, focused on many of the ongoing legacies of slavery in American society. Notwithstanding the enormous progress made by the civil rights movement in the 1960s and early 1970s, there's been many areas where institutional racism has remained a persistent problem in the country in residential segregation, in criminal justice, in educational policies, we see again and again the way in which racial division continues to influence those areas of policy. In 1968, the Kerner Commission warned, this was a government commission that looked into 
the problems of race, particularly in northern urban cities. The commission warned, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And they said that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. And this is a headline uh, which was very shocking in 1968 when it came out, just to see the language in the headline that captured that. That assessment could still apply to many of the same areas of policies that were looked at in the report back in 1968. We've had many studies, for instance, of criminal justice, which have looked at the way in which racism impacts that area of society. When President Trump makes direct or indirect appeals to this and other kinds of reactionary sentiment, uh, he taps into something that's very deeply rooted and still very strong in American political culture. It's important to remember that these ideas uh, have deep roots and they're right below the surface, if not right in front of our eyes. So it's been extremely potent when the president has used rhetoric or sent out messages that tap into these traditions. Finally, the final context to understand President Trump is through the prism of presidential power. And this is now at the heart of the impeachment investigation. In the era of polarization, when Congress became increasingly difficult terrain for presidents, most commanders in chief have been successful in expanding the institutional infrastructure of the executive branch, despite the reforms that came after Watergate. Trump shows how this power can be used. He lives by the famous comment that Richard Nixon made after his presidency ended during an interview with David Frost. When the president does it, Nixon said, that means it's not illegal. Trump has illustrated that even a commander in chief whose skills are questionable can impose his will on the nation if he lacks any sense of restraint uh, or fear of political norms and guardrails. True, President Trump has not been able to run roughshod over Congress or to ignore the constraints of the federal courts, but he has been able to inflict extensive damage on political institutions and have a profound effect on our political culture. He has also used executive orders as a way to advance many of his policy goals. He has used this presidential power to aggravate rather than to calm the fault lines that have divided our country since the 1970s. He's moved forward with his plan to build a wall, for example, uh, despite congressional resistance to doing so using this power. The Trump administration has provided a new example of an old concept, the imperial presidency. The term famously used by the historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in 1973 to discuss the excesses and abuses of the Nixon White House fell out of use after President Nixon fell from grace. The reckoning of Watergate and the first ever resignation of a president seemed to show that the executive branch was not as uncontrollable as it seemed. Despite reforms of the 1970s though, which sought to strengthen the power of Congress, it looks like the imperial presidency is alive and well. And a number of things happened since the 1970s. The most familiar challenge stemmed from the fact that in the midst of national security crises such as 9-11, the nation has been willing to allow presidents to respond to enemies by allowing them to have greater presidential power. Congress has continued to allow presidents to send troops into combat without formal declarations of war, which we haven't had since World War II. Instead, presidents simply seek resolutions of support. In response to the terrorist attacks of September 11th, Congress passed legislation authorizing a vast expansion of the national security system that gave President George W. Bush and then President Obama access to new organizations, power, and institutions to pursue policy without congressional support. 
Since the 1970s, both parties have been willing to grant the part president more power when it serves their purpose. The main dynamic for Democrats has centered around party leaders supporting presidents who use executive action to pursue domestic regulatory changes and rulemaking on issues such as climate change, while Republicans have done the same in moments of divided and united government, often to deregulate or to strengthen national security programs. President Trump has revealed that the president can act imperially also because norms matter as much as rules and procedure. The reformers of the 1970s, the Watergate babies, missed the ways in which reforms can't always constrain a president who doesn't care about the norms or who doesn't care about the institutions. The most important source of presidential restraint has often been the character of the person in office. Putting aside his recklessness or dismissal of convention, President Trump has placed his finger on an essential truth about this political moment. Washington is not in good shape. Extreme partisanship is a reality. It's not an aberration. The president is not always a first mover in creating political chaos and dysfunction. Rather, he's very often responding and capitalizing on the world that Americans have collectively created and going to places that previous presidents have avoided. Reflecting on his presidential victory in 2016, on, on, his, on, on Trump's presidential victory, the outgoing president, Barack Obama, told his biographer and New York editor, David Remnick, just a few weeks after the election, what had happened and how the Republican Party had transformed so dramatically since Ronald Reagan. Obama said, we've seen this coming. Donald Trump is not an outlier. He is a culmination, a logical conclusion of the rhetoric and tactics of the Republican Party for the past 10, 15, 20 years. What surprised me, Obama said, was the degree to which those tactics and rhetoric completely jumped the rails. There are no governing principles. There was no one to say, no, this is going too far. This isn't what we stand for. But we've seen it now, he said, for eight years even with reasonable people like John Boehner, who when push came to shove, wouldn't push back against these currents. Obama was astute, but his realization came a little bit too late. But we should get a better sense, and we should develop a better conversation about how President Trump fits into the era within which he governs, and to understand that as the basis for his presidency. In all four areas, polarization, the news media, the illiberal traditions and presidential power, Trump is standing on ground that is more solid than many would like to admit. Whereas some Democrats like Joe Biden have tried to argue that he's very much a one-time aberration, I think Biden may be underestimating how this all came about. Understanding the connection between the polarized, media-saturated environment in which we live is essential to grasping how President Trump has worked, how he maintains and exercises his power, and ultimately how he might become vulnerable to defeat. What remains unclear is whether his strategy offers a path to a two-term presidency or whether he will join the list of one-term presidents who never got their second four years. Politically, the president is not as strong as he could be. Putting aside impeachment and the doubts about whether he'll even finish the term, it is clear he is not in as strong a position as he should be going in for re-election. He is an incumbent. Most incumbents have won re-election. He has a relatively strong economy. He has relative peace abroad. And he has a very unified party. And yet, he still could very easily lose election in 220. His approval ratings remain low, under 40%, and there are many signs that he won't survive election day if he makes it through impeachment. Even his support with some key groups, such as non-college educated white women who had been very important in 2016, has fallen dramatically, 
And there are now fewer registered Republicans than there were in 2016 as well. And many Americans don't give him credit for the economy, uh, which he is depending on in the future. And again, even more ominous as we speak, the president faces the very real prospect of the House of Representatives voting on articles of impeachment by December and possibly Senate Republicans breaking from the administration, although we can discuss that in questions and answers. Beyond the president's own fate, the question in 220 is not just him, but does this system that we have continue? Do the problems, do the dysfunctions, do the ugliness that President Trump has often exposed in a way that no other leader has been able to do outlast him? Should he win re-election, President Trump could end up legitimating the system that we have. If he loses, it will be an open question as to whether that's the start of something different. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm ready. I will field questions about really anything uh, related to politics, not sports. Um, uh, anything from the talk or, or what's going on today. Yes. Um, in thinking about a comparison of uh, Richard Nixon and Donald Trump yeah. and a revival of an imperial presidency, isn't there a problem? Um, no one in Nixon's cabinet ever said he was a moron. Uh, he actually knew uh, a lot about foreign affairs. He knew a lot about domestic policy. He appointed a number of creative people uh, who came up with very interesting uh, policy uh, proposals. And at least until the very end, when he was consumed by uh, the Watergate investigations, he was a hard-working policymaker. And yes, he was pushing presidential power. And yes, he had imperial ambition. But how can Trump be an imperial president if he's incompetent? Well, you can, you can be strong and incompetent. So take uh, several examples. Um, in terms of the recent decision, this is the most recent example in Syria. That's an example of where a president who doesn't really have the support of many national security officials, it's unclear in his administration who was pushing for this right now. He has many Republicans who oppose what he does, yet he was able to make that move unilaterally uh, and quickly. In some ways, what saves him is that's removing troops. Uh, you can imagine if he had placed troops in the middle of a conflict the same way, there'd be a lot, a lot more fallout. Uh, the president, in terms of uh, how he's gone after legitimate investigations, um, doesn't mean he's competent, or you can uh, say, say what you want about his intelligence, uh, but he still has the power to act very aggressively in going after key institutions. His rhetoric matters. And he's kind of unleashed an ongoing war against the media, against intelligence agencies, against law enforcement. That's a president acting imperial and having an effect in the public culture, uh, uh, even if you question his skill set. Uh, and he has moved on policy, or his administration has. I mean, there have been a lot of significant changes in the area of regulation. Uh, and not to mention the tax cut that went through, that are consequential. And if they're not reversed, they will really uh, change some of the direction of what was going on with carbon emissions under Obama and won't be easy to put back into place. So those are just a few examples of where, yes, President Trump is certainly not Nixon in terms of his political savvy, mastery of policy, or the people surrounding him, but he could still do a lot. Uh, and, and so that's why I, I, look, I look at it that way. Um, and in some ways, it's more dramatic when he does it. I mean, because uh, he does it without the apparatus that Nixon had. Yeah. Here and there. Yeah. You, you used the word I was thinking about several times at the end of your talk, aberration. Yeah. I'm sort of going to ask, who is the aberration? Is it Trump or is it Obama? Given that that's a good question. Really gave us yeah. saying that Trump is a product of you know, 40 years of yeah. 
So that's one question, but related to that too, is do you also see patterns of just flipping? You know, Obama, eight years, we went, the country went a whole different way. Is the country likely to flip back in some way in reaction each time the president is in office? So th that's a good question. And um, I, I haven't heard it formulated that way. Is Obama the aberration? And so, which is really interesting. He is and he isn't, meaning that speech in 2004, I don't know if you want to call it an aberration, but it certainly was aspirational. And it didn't describe what he himself encountered as president. So when, when I wrote this book with my co-author, Kevin Cruz, Fault Lines, it comes out of a course that we taught, I teach now, about the US. And a lot of the themes we covered uh, are, are the kinds of uh, issues we're talking about, kind of how the media became this way, how parties became this way. But we really finished the whole book before Trump was a candidate. And a lot of what we were looking at as it related to the contemporary period was Obama's presidency, meaning while Obama had these aspirations, he very quickly learned how the political world had totally changed uh, from what he thought it could be. He encountered uh, this new Republican Party at every turn. He saw the kind of obstructionism and, and new procedural warfare that really stifled uh, a lot of his agenda after that first year. He constantly uh, expressed frustration with different parts of the news media uh, and what he had to deal with in trying to govern a nation. So, so I actually think uh, Obama was certainly very different than President Trump, but they were both in the same world. Look, a lot of the work uh, on the Tea Party, which is in place in 2011, uh, it, it's similar to what Trump's doing at the presidential level. There, there is a connection there. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's not gonna flip very easily because this is the way politics is structured. It's, it's the way our institutions are working. It will require some pretty profound changes. You might have a flip in party. You might have an emphasis on different issues. Uh, but it's not as if you're going to go to Capitol Hill in 2021, whatever happens, and find that the Republican leadership, for example, is working in radically different ways. It's not as if you're going to look at what states are doing on districting and see that, oh my gosh, all of a sudden, they're all using bipartisan commissions and neutrally carving up districts. Uh, all of that's going to continue. Fox News isn't going away. Um, so, so I think... Uh, that, that's how I see it. And, and I think that's why I always say that, that the, the storyline of our book doesn't end with Trump. Uh, and, and he is just expressing this and diving in deep in a way Obama didn't want to do. Yeah. Uh, you spoke for a while about the varying sources of political polarization. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering how do you respond to uh, contentions from other scholars like Fiorina who say that political polarization is less a concern among the public than it is partisan sorting among partisan elites? Good question. Uh, so there's this debate in political science. You have a large group of political scientists who study polarization and all of its sources from the way districts are made uh, to the way uh, congressional rules were remade in the 1970s. But then you have a few other scholars, and this scholar, Mo, Mo, Fiorina, Mo Fiorina, Morris Fiorina, he's one of the leading ones. He argues that if you look at public opinion, the country isn't as polarized as Washington is. And, and a lot of issues, people see a lot of gray. They don't see everything in black and white. And on even high profile issues or hot button issues like abortion, uh, often you'll find people, they, they see the middle ground on this. Um, and so that's an interesting argument, but the way it plays out in the politics is still polarized. So uh, even if the public is muddied, the people who are being elected to go to office are not. And for whatever reason, even if they personally kind of see some kind of common ground, all the incentives in Washington, from the way they need to raise money, to the way in which they can get media time, to the way in which the leaders expect them to behave, is gonna push them in a very different direction. And ultimately, that's most consequential on governing. Uh, and then there's counter evidence to what he's saying, simply about how voters have moved around and uh, concentrated in certain areas, red and blue. That's real too, even if the opinion is muddier. 
the votes are still concentrated, and that has an effect in Washington. So, so I think that debate's important. I think what's most important is to remember that most Americans, uh, there's often, there would be ways, conceivably, to break out of some of the log jams that we face, but the political process isn't working that way, and it's not going to work that way anytime soon. Uh, and so, kind of, that's why that part of the literature, for me, uh, is more helpful in explaining how things are working. And he, he understands that too. I mean, that's part of his argument. The essence of his argument is this is not all natural. It's not all that we are divided as a people so much as the institutions and the elites are very divided. Although there's some issues we are divided on. I mean, well, we shouldn't ignore that either. And I've been, I've been thinking a little bit more about that just watching some of the debates on issues like immigration play out. There are some pretty big divisions that we shouldn't ignore either. Other questions? I'm confused about Barr and the Mueller report. Barr and the Mueller report. Can you discuss a little bit? But what part confuses you? I just, anything that you want to Sure, look, that, I, I think the, the, the Mueller report, which looms so large for a while, and Attorney General Barr. Uh, the, the, the Mueller report, um, I don't know how many people read it. Uh, it, was, it was very extensive, and it basically had two different areas of findings. The first area was that during the 2016 campaign, there was Russian interference uh, an extensive campaign to influence and sway the election. And that first part of the report documented all sorts of connections that were made between people working for the Trump administration uh, and people involved in that interference uh, operation. There was no proof of a criminal conspiracy to coordinate, uh, which was the bar that they set up. Uh, but it, 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 it there's lots of bad stuff in there. There's, there's all kinds uh, of interactions uh, that are certainly unsavory at best. Many legal scholars say uh, criminal. Uh, the second part of the report, it's very damaging. And I, I have read that many times, and I don't see a way out of that conclusion. It's about uh, an administration obstructing uh, investigation and repeated areas where essentially the report is telling Congress, look into this, uh, where the president either directly or indirectly, privately, publicly, was trying to stifle and delegitimate a totally legitimate uh, investigation sanctioned by his own uh, administration and Justice Department. That's what the report was. Uh, it didn't reach a conclusion. No, it, it couldn't have. That's the key. So we had, in 1978, some of you will remember, Congress passed a, a law that created something called the independent prosecutor. It was a response to Watergate. And that basically set up a totally independent figure who would investigate executive branch corruption and then release a report that could be very forthcoming, even suggesting impeachment. The last time we had that in effect was Kenneth Starr and President Bill Clinton. And after that all happened, Congress and the president allowed this law to expire. And so now the way that this is done is through the Justice Department. And according to the regulations, which Mueller was responding to, he is not supposed to recommend what happens. He is supposed to essentially lay out a case lay out the roadmap, and hand it to his superior, the Attorney General, as well as Congress. Uh, so he didn't do anything that uh, kind of violated his uh, charge. And I think that's probably why it was written the way it was. He was careful to follow what the rules are as we have them. Attorney General Barr made a very aggressive move, uh, and it was definitely a political move and kind of got this report and very quickly said, there's nothing there. And I can't see that as anything other than a political strategy because it doesn't jive with what's in the report. There's certainly lots of bad things in there. But what it did was obviously to very early on dictate how reporters covered this, what people immediately were saying about it. And I think it gave the administration some time to sell that idea that there was nothing in it. Within a few weeks, 
The narrative changed. Many members of Congress said, hey, that's not what the report says. Many very respected legal experts, some conservatives, all said that's not what the report said. But Barr uh, was very effective. Uh, Barr, just I'll, I'll finish on, I, I told you I can talk a lot. Uh, Attorney General Barr is someone who is a real veteran of Washington. He's worked in uh, several administrations. And, and his animating, uh, one of his animating ideas until now has been the importance of executive power. It's been that ultimately he has a very robust view of how strong presidents are and how insulated they should be uh, from other branches, uh, including Congress. And, and he was, of course, uh, uh, involved in the pardon of people who were involved with the Iran-Contra scandal under Ronald Reagan when he worked for George H.W. Bush. And he wrote memos really defending the executive branch. And that's part of who he is intellectually. And I think that's consistent with what he's saying now. He doesn't believe that the president can be guilty of a lot of what Congress or Democrats have accused him of. But he's also turned out to be a pretty savvy political person and very aggressive. And many people don't like that. This is not what we expect from the attorney general. Uh, but I think that's who Barr, Barr is. And Barr is, more than Rudy Giuliani, the point man for this administration in the next few months in trying to protect the president from being impeached. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do some homework for our students. Uh, as you know, Washington and Lee University has a uh, mock convention yeah. in which the I heard uh, about students um, uh, have a tremendous track record in selecting the uh, out party's presidential nominee uh, for the year uh, for the election coming up. So we have uh, state delegations, we've got uh, uh, committees, and uh, students undertaking all sorts of research on the question of who is going to be the Democratic nominee. So I want to ask you. Who is going to be uh, the Democratic nominee? Well, I still believe, I have, I have said for a long time, and I still believe that it will be Elizabeth Warren. And I wish I was as good on predicting politics. I was that good with sports, because all my teams lose. Uh, but, but, but with this, I've always uh, seen her as a very formidable candidate. Uh, and I think right now she's in a great position to win. And this is not a normative claim if she's the best or not. I just think in terms of campaigning and where things are, she's in the right place. The most important is just her trajectory. I mean, her trajectory out of all the candidates, Biden, Buttigieg, Harris, Sanders, it's the only one that keeps moving upwards in terms of polls, in terms of people, uh, in terms of money and even media coverage. It just keeps moving in the right way. So it's not that surprising she ends up where she is. Biden has really stagnated in many ways. He's declined, uh, certainly with his fundraising that was just released. Some of the other candidates have gone up and down. Kamala Harris is an example. She has a steady uh, move up. Second, I think she uh, is a pretty good campaigner. I do. I think uh, she's been very smart in kind of conventional politics, uh, very early on bringing uh, together a large team in Obama-like strategy in states like Iowa, New Hampshire, not waiting. She's one of the first movers there. She spent an enormous amount of time there. She's also a little Obama-like in, she's very steady. And I think that's going to be important in this environment. This environment can consume you if you are a politician, because things change within minutes, within hours. I'm sure since I spoke, 10 things have happened. And what I've seen from her, which I didn't know as much until she really did it, was she, she's very, she's kind of a precision candidate uh, on, on her ideas, her focus, her argument. She's not easily kind of turned by the latest news. The, the noise, so to speak, doesn't totally distract her. Third, I think she has, and I think a lot of candidates, I think they have a lot of good candidates, Democrats, who could win. Just saying why I think she's probably at top. I think even though now she is part of the left part of the primary, she has the ability to be a coalitional candidate. I think she can be a very traditional candidate because at the heart of her message is that working class America, middle class America is struggling. And she now tells that story through her own life and her work on policy has been just about that with consumer protection. 
And I think that's the issue that gives Democrats the best bet to build a big tent. And many candidates who are left in the primaries can shift. I think she's one who can do it. And finally, I do think there's power uh, right now uh, to a female candidate at the head of the ticket in the era of President Trump. Uh, it, it can mobilize in very significant ways. So, so all of that is a long uh, answer to why I think she's probably the strongest candidate. But it's a, it, it, it is definitely not a stable um, competition, meaning you have three people who are still legitimate front runners, uh, including Biden, who has survived his polls much better than I thought. And if Biden either falls out or starts to slip, I, I was talking earlier, I think that other field, the non-Warren field, is really going to open up. Uh, and people like Buttigieg have a really serious campaign team and a serious presence in those early states. So if you see uh, Joe Biden say within the next two months, things just fall apart. He Bidens it. Uh, and I, I guess I could coin that. Well, it's live streaming. So he Bidens it. You know, someone like a, a Mayor Pete will be in position in an Iowa or New Hampshire to do extremely well, if not win. Uh, or Harris, or you know, pick Klobuchar. And so I think, there, I think there's a lot of uncertainty of where this is going to be. This will be an election or primary where Iowa and New Hampshire matter. Uh, I do think that momentum boost is going to be serious since you have so many people and, and since it's moving around. But Warren is strong. She's really a serious candidate. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm kind of curious uh, to what degree uh, codifying the norms that you're talking about might be part of the solution. Yeah. Because I think that we've learned that a chain is an emotivating factor for a lot of people. You can accrue a lot of power. So for like, Perfect example of this would be avoiding a vote on Merrick Garland, where normally people would say this is something that we should be doing as part of our role as the uh, legislative branch, and just by avoiding it, we could have a potential 40-year impact on the uh, Supreme Court. Well, so uh, you mean codif do you need to codify the norms? Yeah. yeah. Well, it could. I mean, we, we tried that in the 70s. Some of it worked. Some of it didn't work because what you discover is that even when you codify norms, a shrewd president will find a way around, uh, around the processes that are now rules. But certainly it's stronger. I think you're right. What not President Trump, what kind of this last year of Republican politics has revealed, there is a lot of room to violate norms without any serious consequences. Merrick Garland and that confirmation or non-confirmation battle was very relevant. And the lesson was very clear that you could do something like that. You could cement a key uh, moment for your party, and you can get away with it. And so I think that's why you even hear in Democratic races now talks about reforming the nomination process for the Supreme Court, expanding the court. People are now looking, how do you change things if the norms aren't going to have any kind of effect? It's not just shame. It's it's kind of no electoral punishment is just as important. Meaning it's not just that, oh, McConnell's not embarrassed. Uh, more important is that McConnell's majority went up in 2018. So why shouldn't he do what he does? Uh, meaning there, there's a great political scientist, Francis Lee. I recommend everyone reads her book. And, and part of her argument is one thing that's happened in American politics since the 80s is neither party has a solid majority in Congress for very long keep flipping back and forth, it's narrow parties. So the effect is the incentives for each party are to be really kind of ruthlessly partisan to keep that advantage. And so she argues people might really dislike what McConnell did. They might think it's really not good for a democracy, but it's totally reasonable. Uh, it makes sense from his perspective. And so then I think you're, that is interesting. Does that then create more of a debate for how do you create actual rules uh, that are easier to uh, enforce? Or can the Senate change its confirmation process, which it has the power to do, create certain rules that will prevent that? It could happen. It could happen. Uh, but, but we're not there yet. Uh, at this point, I don't think uh, the majority has any interest in doing anything like that. That's the problem with congressional reform. You need a majority, the majority power to reform the chamber. And the majority power usually benefits from the rules, so rarely do they want to change it. But that's a really good question, and I think gets to a bigger 
issue that's now come to the surface. And certainly with the presidency, that's important. We did, after Watergate, try to change certain rules. The War Powers Act was an effort in 73, before Watergate totally breaks, to create rules that will ensure more uh, buy-in from Congress in, in sending troops overseas. The budget reform of 1974 was an effort to strengthen the rules so that the president couldn't just run roughshod over Congress in terms of money. The independent counsel I talked about was a way in 78 where Congress said, we can't just count on people to not be corrupt. We have to have someone to enforce this. But uh, some of those have unintended consequences. Some of those don't work as we imagine. And some of them, in the end, presidents find ways around them. So it's kind of an ongoing challenge. Yeah. So far, the GOP has allocated a huge amount of time in order to help Donald Trump's re-election campaign, if the impeachment proceedings continue and begin to look bad on the Republican Party and Trump loses the support of key members of the party like McConnell, Huckabee, or Lindsey Graham, do you believe that they would throw their weight behind a different candidate rather than support the president? Well, if he lost support of, of McConnell, he might not even make it uh, to the election, meaning McConnell's the power broker of the Republican Party, not President Trump. And if he literally said, we're done with him, uh, I could see your then think, then impeachment and removal is possible. Uh, it would be a big haul to get McConnell to think that way. Um, it, it's hard to imagine without that happening uh, a different nominee. We're, we're pretty deep into the election at this point. It's not easy. Uh, there is no, the way to do it would be a major primary challenge right now. Someone needs to be raising money and running. The major Republican figures like John Kasich have not done it. Uh, the ones who are running, Sanford and Walsh, those are not major Republican figures. So I don't think, I think as time ticks, I think as each month goes on, even if some, even if Lindsay, it's hard to imagine now Lindsey Graham really defecting from the president. I mean, he's been the most loyal person a president could imagine. Uh, but if somehow that all started to break, it's not the same as impeachment and removal. It's pretty late to get a Republican. They can do it. I mean, they can go close to the election uh, and do some kind of brokered convention. But all that's really, uh, it's really hard to imagine. I, I think the more pertinent question is does President Trump lose 20 Republican votes in the Senate? That's what we're asking right now. Uh, and, and what he's counting on the president, in my opinion, is partisanship. He is counting on what I said in the talk, that partisan loyalty will be more important than anything else for Republicans, and that will limit any losses he'll have in the Senate. But the problem is that could be his kryptonite, meaning what you said is exactly the greatest danger he faces that we hit a point, a tipping point, where some story comes out or the polls are changing even more rapidly, where McConnell and Graham make the calculation that if we stick by him, our party is going to suffer. We're going to lose our majority. We're going to lose the presidency. That's when the president's in trouble. I mean, in terms of if he can even last. We're not there yet, but that's kind of what you're looking for uh, politically. That's what happened with Nixon. Uh, Republicans certainly who are the minority in Congress generally are supportive of him until really the last few months, if not the last few weeks. And, and it wasn't just shock and awe that leads them to finally decide to tell him in a famous meeting, we won't support you in the Senate or you don't have the votes. It's also the just kind of vision of what's going to happen to the Republican Party if they don't do something, if they stand by the president. If you want to read a great book uh, on Watergate, read Elizabeth Drew's uh, Washington Journal. It's an unbelievable book by a reporter, and it's like a diary. So you see her covering Watergate day by day, and that's part of what she really traces. Now, from hindsight, it looks like it was inevitable. But one of the things you see is it took a lot to get Republicans to break, and Democrats wanted it to be bipartisan in 74. That was important. And, and that's why it happened. So it's that partisan shift that you're looking for now. Yeah. How do you personally feel the move towards 
extreme political correctness has had an impact on the rise of Trump? Or do you not think that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, the political correctness is a political term. So it means different things when I talk to different crowds. I think it has been a term that the president has used very aggressively. It is a term used to denote a, a kind of social or cultural extremism, uh, either on college campuses or on the coasts or where Democrats tend to live. That's what political correctness is. It's rarely used, for example, uh, conservative political correctness. You could easily say is, is something we could talk about as well, but you rarely, you rarely hear that. So, so I always push back a little bit because I feel like it's been a political form of rhetoric uh, used to caricature people. Uh, I think there's some issues where I don't know why it's called political correctness as opposed to legitimate debates uh, over some serious issues. So we had at Princeton debates about uh, race on college campus and how African-American students were treated uh, and was the uh, faculty and the programming uh, kind of as robust and diverse as possible. That's a legitimate debate to have. Uh, and uh, I don't think that's really at the core of what's been going on. I think often it's about certain cases where the debates seem kind of extreme or excessive, and they've often been used uh, as, as ways to vilify often legitimate issues. So I'm not sure that's at the core of what he's doing. Uh, if, if there's an issue that's a core, it's an issue like immigration. That's not political correctness. That's about what our border policy should be. So if you're talking about should uh, more or fewer people be allowed into the country, should you be uh, placing uh, little children uh, in the facilities, the cages where they are, that's not about political correctness. Uh, that's about human rights, that's about border policy. So I'm never quite sure that's really at the heart of what he's doing. And I can go through other issues uh, that way. Uh, yes, get some. Here and then in the back, yeah. <coughs> As an older person, I can remember a time when you know, in politics, if you were on the left, you were quoted words like socialism. Yep. And even liberalism came to be bad. You were. Yep. Mike Dukakis. I've been fascinated by the rise of Bernie Sanders and the open espousal of socialism. Yeah. In our political discourse. And I noted at the end of the State of the Union address that Trump said America will never be a socialist country. Yeah. Is that going to become an issue again? That will be an issue. I, I mean, I, I don't have a full grasp of how this has all happened, uh, meaning just the embrace of an idea that Democrats certainly were so uh, scared to be associated with. Uh, and, and, and there's many things that have happened. I think, obviously, the condition of the economy for many Americans has given room for people to go beyond conventional liberal conservative, and for some younger Americans, this just offers an opportunity uh, to think about questions that matter. How am I going to get to college? How am I going to get a job that's secure? And, and some of the candidates who are democratic socialists have kind of been a generation dealing with those questions. Uh, I think it's obviously we're past the Cold War, so it did create space to bring back an idea of democratic socialism that isn't necessarily going to be equated with the Soviet Union. You know, this new generation, they're removed from the Cold War. Uh, so it's very different. They're even removed from the politics of the Cold War. It's interesting. Trump is still from that generation, uh, but some of the younger voters are not. And then there's Sanders. I mean, sometimes candidates can just transform debate. It's like I was thinking Ronald Reagan was so powerful in 1980 because he took these ideas that when Goldwater ran in 64 were extreme conservative, out of the mainstream, never acceptable. But this guy, by 1980, part of it was him. He figured out a way to sell that vision to the country, to make it legitimate, to kind of take ideas percolating in the conservative movement and make them a winning thing. And I think even though Sanders isn't a winning candidate, there's a little bit that he did in 2016. He just threw out all these ideas and the term. And, and kind of said that uh, you know, it's okay for some Democrats if they want to go big and to be robust. And 
even to use that term. It will be part of the campaign. You're absolutely right. I think President Trump is going to use this against whoever the candidate is. If it's Joe Biden or Amy Klobuchar, they will be socialists. Count on it. Uh, and he will connect them to the squad, the four legislators uh, who are associated with this wing. Uh, and it will be part of the campaign. I don't know if it will work. I mean, Democrats worry, yes. That will paint the party as too left of center. It will be the Cold War all over again. But, but let's see. Uh, maybe politics has changed, and maybe this term is coming back in new ways where it can be part of a Democratic Party. Uh, not the whole thing, but part of it. But it's a fascinating thing. I think you're absolutely right, especially for people uh, who grew up. I mean, we each grew up in different moments where that was... Uh, for me, the most formidable political moment as a young person was in college. I mean, the first real campaign was 1988, and it was Dukakis against Bush, George H.W. Bush. And, and part of the strategy, even though the Cold War was coming to an end, was really to eviscerate Dukakis uh, as, as too far left and as too close uh, to left-wing ideas. And he was scared of using the term liberal. Not socialist, liberal. Uh, that's actually the election that kind of really triggered my interest in doing what I do. Uh, I wrote a, a junior thesis about Massachusetts liberalism after that. Uh, and so it's funny you mentioned that. But, but I think we're in a different era. So I'm not sure all the fears are well placed. But, but that will be solved. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of your talk, you posed an interesting question of whether polarization or part of the world. Yeah. Are there any trends that might help us to historically give the answer to this question? Or are you expect to be something? Sure. The trends are it will get worse, not better. Because when uh, the way that politics works uh, is working because of how the institutions are set up and how uh, basic elements of the process work, it doesn't go away if you don't reform those. So. Example, if the way our districts are being constructed now in an age of hyper-technology that allows redistricting to be done very well is a key part of why the House of Representatives, not all of them, but the House, tends to be very polarized because of the districts members have. If you don't change the way that districting is done in the states, it's hard for me to understand or envision how that situation is going to change in the next decade, uh, because that is all going to be the same. Two, if we're in an era where a lot of Americans now get their news from partisan sources and, and tend to look at news sources that will confirm what they already want to hear, which is increasingly true, if we don't change the delivery of news and, and and that dynamic doesn't change, that's not going to go away either. And I can go through a million examples like that. Uh, so that's why I think the trend line is very clear. And there's only a few moments in American history where you have periods of real reform. The early progressive era, the progressive era, the 70s. Uh, so the only question is, do we have one of those moments that if things get so bad? But I don't think we're there right now. I just don't see any movement on those issues. Uh, yeah, let me just get someone else in there. Yeah. yeah sure. um, in 2016, it seemed the polarization within the Democratic Party played a role in their loss. Now it seems the polarization within the Democratic Party is as much more more than before in terms of the center and the progressive left. Is this going to be a problem for the Democrats going into 2020? Well, um, it depends how the polarization plays out, meaning I, I assume this is what you're saying, that Part of the kind of rift between the Sanders and the Clinton supporters uh, ultimately hurt Clinton because uh, not everyone was enthused when that was over. Then you can add that Jill Stein ran and, and actually took a lot of votes in states like Wisconsin that could have certainly benefited uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, so there, there is some element to that. I mean, Trump didn't really present Hillary Clinton as a Sanders. So he didn't use it in the campaign in the way we were just imagining you could see this time. That's not what he attacked her as, the email scandal stuff and uh, you know, those, those sorts of issues. <clears throat> so the question is, what happens today? Rifts don't have to kind of devastate a party. 
I mean, the most divisive primary I've seen wasn't 2016, recently. It was 2008. It was between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And it wasn't a socialist versus mainstream Democrat, but it was pretty contentious over Iraq as a symbol of the party. Where you stood on Iraq and the vote on Iraq and the war in Iraq, that defined who you were. And, and those primaries were brutal. I mean, people really didn't like each other, but yet Barack Obama was able to recover from that. He was able to find ways to bring the Clinton supporters into his coalition. So I don't think it's inevitable that that rift, which is stronger today than in 2016, is uh, inherently going to devastate the party against Trump. What you have to remember is by the fall, if President Trump is still President Trump, that's where the Democratic focus will be. And when you have a president this unpopular and this hated by many Democrats, as some of the comments I've now heard uh, suggest, that is also a powerful unifying force, as much as a candidate who can figure that out. So I think they can actually survive it. Um, it will be a challenge. It will be a challenge, but I think they can. The key is that the Democrats figure out a way to harness it, meaning uh, parties that have very enthusiastic and base voices, the parties that succeed, I think they don't isolate them. And this is true in both parties. They learn how to use those. That becomes a source of mobilizing voters. That becomes a source of just energizing the party, even if everyone doesn't disagree with them. And that's a challenge for the party leaders and whoever the candidate is. Okay, yeah. Oh. One more question. Uh, one more question. OK. Yes. You can ask me after, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> what do you believe is the greatest threat to American democracy? The greatest threat to, all right, can I give, do I have to just do one? Can I give three quick ones? One, um, I do believe the reversal of the Voting Rights Act of 65 was, it's a threat to American democracy. I think I wrote a book about Johnson in the 60s, and that was really a, whole, a landmark moment for the country. And I think the Supreme Court decision to overturn part of that, and then uh, some of the laws in the states, I think are damaging. I think ultimately our problem is not voter fraud, it's that not enough people vote. And everything we do should be pointing to getting as many people into the polls as possible. It's hard to imagine a long-term health of a democracy where people don't exercise that fundamental right. And there's no excuse for laws that inhibit it. So that's number one. Number two is disinformation. And I've become its more scared as a person, as a citizen, uh, not just as a scholar, about the ease of disinformation in our kind of commons, in our public commons. And I'm not talking about partisan perspectives on the news or anything like that. I'm talking about outright lies, doctored videos, fake data that is now really circulating quite easily. And we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And is increasingly becoming part of mainstream information. Uh, and you know, the, the one threat people keep saying is now it's so easy to doctor video that you will see in elections, you know, fake images of candidates doing all sorts of things. Uh, and, and that will become part of the public. So I think that's really, really dangerous to our democracy because we can survive fundamental disagreements. We can survive contentious periods, angry periods. But when there is no common source of facts, and there is fake information in the commons, then everything really does fall apart. And it's hard to make any kind of negotiation work. Deliberation falls by the wayside. And you can have leaders doing pretty dangerous things when that is mainstreamed. So I think that's a kind of second, um, a second source uh, of, of, I'll leave it at those two. Those are the two big ones that I'm thinking of these days. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.